And uh, I just stress that we're talking about the assessment and accreditation of the learners, not the OER. And uh, um, I noticed on one of the things that was shortened and didn't say that. Um, um, uh, this is a, a, a social science and humanities research council project that I'm going to describe to you that, uh, um, that we're doing. And I'm doing it with uh, uh, Wayne McIntosh from New Zealand and uh, Diane Conrad who works at our university. So uh, um, we're working together on this. And uh, before I get going, I'm just going to back up a bit and tell you um, why um, we're doing this. And it's a bit different from uh, some of the reasons uh, for supporting OER that I've heard here. So I want to make it uh, quite clear. And I'm going back to the original copyright laws which created uh, the public domain. Um, there was no public domain before copyright came. And copyright's been turned on its head from an act for the encouragement of learning um, and in the United States, of an act to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And they've tried to switch that around, and I want us to get back to that. Um, but we're pushing uh, OER, and yes, there are great cost benefits on it. Um, but what we see happening with uh, um, the new copyright laws uh, that are, are being uh, uh, pushed on us um, is that with digital re res rights management, or I call it digital restrictions management, and digital licenses. Um, I suggest to you that um, we can't use proprietary content. That in an educational setting, it is becoming impossible for us to teach and uh, learn using proprietary content. Um, with digital rights management, when they put the lock on, you can't copy, you can't paste, you can't annotate, you can't highlight, um, you can't use uh, text-to-speech, uh, uh, you can't change the format, you can't even move your material from one computer to the other, uh, you can't print it out, um, you can't move it geographically. Uh, so as, uh, if you have students in four or five different countries as we do as an open university, um, uh, we would have to get separate copyright licenses for each con uh, country. And uh, they have, uh, uh, quite often they have kill dates on them, that on a certain date they go into your computer and they take it out. And uh, you license it so you can't resell it uh, uh, if you buy it. Um, all of these things that they stop us from doing are things that we need to be doing in a modern education, especially when we're talking about um, uh, mobile learning and using tablets for learning instead of print. And we see the world as moving away from print, and therefore, um, within the digital world, um, we can't use these. And, uh, you know, they want the perfect copy protection. Um, <laughs> Uh, th this is a joke, but actually a, an American congressman actually uh, 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 brought this up in a bill in Congress. It was, it, it was never passed, but they wanted to give the right of, uh, uh, to the publishers to go into your computer and destroy your computer if you were using copyrighted material illegally. Um, and the other one is, is, of course, the digital licenses which reinforce all of the digital rights management uh, uh, areas. So even if they got rid of digital rights management, um, you still can't use them in an educational setting. Um, uh, with the license, owners have no liability even if the product doesn't work. Um, they have the full right, you've given them full permission uh, to invade your computer uh, without any further permission. When you click on it, you've given them that permission. Um, they, they have the right to collect and use your personal data. And uh, you, you have the license as a privilege. You have a privilege to use the product. You don't own it. So when you, in Amazon, when you click on it, it says buy this digital book. Um, they're lying to you. You're not buying it. You're licensing it. You don't own it. Um, you're prohibited to show the content to the others. So if you're reading your textbook and uh, 
you want to show it to your uh, fellow student or to your spouse, um, you must immediately, immediately uh, just, uh, delete it from your computer and notify the publisher. And you've agreed to that. Read the licenses. Uh, you must accept the fact that you have no rights whatsoever. Now, if people think they can work in a, uh, a learning environment under those conditions, I think they're sadly mistaken. Um, and you will be caught because they are spying on you. Uh, two weeks ago, um, I moved uh, uh, to another computer and I put a, uh, um, a, an audio book that I bought legally and they took it off me. And uh, uh, iTunes just popped and they said, you have no legal right to use this book. And I had every legal right to do it. Uh, but what I had to do is go to the company and get a, a key from them and give the key to, to, uh, uh, to uh, Apple. And then they decided, okay, you are legal. We'll let you have it back. And I mean, we just can't work under those types of conditions. So for me, uh, um, going to open education resources is not a choice for educators. It's something we have to do. We must get away from proprietary material. But that's an aside uh, as I get into the problem that we're studying. is this, that learners who access OER and acquire knowledge sk skills, they cannot have their learning assessed and accredited at the present time. <clears throat> So our objectives is we're going to map existing projects around the world internationally on assessment and accreditation. We're going to analyze and evaluate scalable approaches to assessment and accreditation and document the lessons we learn and we're going to propose conceptual frameworks. And we're doing this, um, um, I guess it's an action research project we're on uh, because we are using this to build the Open Education Research University concept. And uh, for people who uh, are more interested in it, we have a, a logic model and a plan of action that's available online. If you type in just OERU, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get to it on, uh, with Google, and, uh, uh, or you can use that long um, website there. Um, but uh, uh, what we're doing with OERU is uh, um, creating a system for accrediting, evaluating, and then accrediting uh, learners who learn using open education resources on their own. So this is the model. The, uh, uh, the learners use open curriculum, uh, there's open design, pedagogy, etc. support systems, and uh, um, they apply to the participating educational institutions where they get uh, open assessment and uh, uh, credentialing and, uh, and it's part of the community service mission of the uh, universities and uh, from that they get a credible qualification for what they've done and we have a support infrastructure based on open business models and uh, infrastructure and uh, open student administration so the, the learning is free, but you pay for the accreditation. So um, you go to an institution, and uh, um, that institution charges whatever they, they feel uh, needs to be charged. And to guarantee the credibility of open scholarship for academic credit, the assessment process must be strictly equivalent to that for mainstream students. So, very, very strict on this, that we want to make sure that this is not questionable from a quality point of view, that our assessment is a real assessment that is comparable to the assessment in traditional universities. Um, so the open assessment, because of this, must involve the payment of a fee. So there has to be some kind of a cost recovery for the institutions that are participating, um, either through the student paying or possibly through a uh, a scholarship scheme or uh, a combination of both or any other methods that, that come about. So the participating institutions must have credible local accreditation. So if it's a U.S. participant, it must be accredited by one of the accrediting agencies. 
In Canada, it must be recognized by the provincial government. In Australia, it has to be recognized by the state government. So it has to have a formal, um, uh, credible accreditation. Um, we're using the uh, uh, working with FPOL and the OPAL on quality standards to make sure that uh, um, our assessment process meets those quality standards and with the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in higher education. The typical model of what we have for any university, uh, Judith uh, Murray pointed this out to us uh, um, at Thompson Rivers University, is uh, you've got, there are students at our university, um, they're using our content and they have our support. But what we're moving to is a situation where any <coughs> students can come along using any content that they come across and any kind of support system that they have. And, uh, but they will get our assessment. If they want an Athabasca University uh, credit, then we will assess it and we will do that. And uh, they could go to another university and get their, uh, their assessment. But the idea is we're moving away from this where we own the students, we own the content, we own the faculty to a, a, a different model. And so it works like this. Uh, Jim Taylor at the University of Southern Queensland in Australia came up with this. Is, uh, so the learners access the courses based solely on OER. And I don't agree with them on that. I think let them use proprietary if they want. But we will uh, uh, identify pathways to, cr to credits um, using solely OER. But if they want to use other things, that's fine too. Um, uh, we've, uh, uh, we're beginning uh, the creation of Academic Volunteers International. Uh, so as uh, retired professors and, and others who want to participate and help students, um, we'll find a way of getting them involved in this. We're also looking at student mentors, perhaps a scholarship system where you pass a course and then you mentor the course and we can give you credit on your assessment and things like that. So as students who've recently passed the course will be available online to help the students who are going through it. Uh, then we have open assessment from the participating institutions. Uh, the participating institutions, they grant the credit for the courses and then they're awarded when they have enough, they get a, a real credible degree um, or other credible credential. So the, the learning scenarios, you have the one we all know, the formal learning uh, at a credentialing institution. Uh, Non-formal learning is uh, uh, you take a course for your union in, uh, uh, or you, a society, your, your work at the Red Cross and they give you this different types of training things. And uh, uh, there's informal learning where you just learn on your own. You go on in the web or anywhere, you just learn it the, whichever which way you can. And uh, all three of them uh, will be counted towards your degree uh, at the university. So you may have 10 courses uh, from different institutions. Uh, you may have a lot of these mini courses from your workplace. And you've done a lot of informal learning yourself. And uh, to do this, uh, um, we add on RPL, Recognition of Prior Learning, or we call it PLAR. There's a number of different names for it. And as part of our research now, we're looking at ways to make PLAR um, cost-effective and scalable. Because right now, it's a very um, labor-intensive process. And uh, we believe there are ways of bringing down the uh, cost structure for doing PLAR and recognizing people's, uh, people's learning. Um, there's other forms of assessment besides PLAR, of course, the transfer credit, which we do. Our university has transfer credit agreements right across Canada 
uh, we're an American accredited institution, so our credits are readily accepted by uh, nearly every institution in, in the United States. Um, and uh, generally around the world in Britain they accept it. And vice versa, so as the American participants, the American universities, um, generally it's, it's recognized for transfer credit. And then there's the challenge for credit where we have an exam and the student says, I know uh, uh, my French is good enough to pass a second year French exam. So we give them the second year French exam, they pass the exam and we give them the credit for that. And uh, it could be, you know, hey, I, you know, I've worked in a lab and my biology is great, I can pass a biology exam. But we also show the pathways, so as a student can, before the exam, will be able to say, yeah, I know this, 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 and this. I don't know this, I'll look at that, and then I'm ready for the exam. And of course, then there's the portfolio learning, which is used uh, uh, a lot in, uh, in uh, PLAR. And we're looking at other possible ways of uh, assessing. So what it does is give freedom to the learners uh, to enroll in and complete courses at institutions of a learner's choice. Freedom to change institutions as they strive to complete a program. Uh, freedom to transfer credits among institutions, nationally and internationally. And to have prior learning assessed and accredited. So, uh, the research questions uh, we're looking at, uh, and these are just some examples of them. Uh, you know, is a MOOC formal, non-formal, or informal? Um, how would a batch system fit into this? And how do uh, credit transfer, uh, portfolio assessment, challenge exams, etc., uh, interact? So that is the uh, um, uh, uh, the research project, and I'm uh, just going to go now. Just uh, Wayne McIntosh couldn't be here for this, so uh, I'm going to uh, go over quickly some of his, uh, his slides so as you have a better understanding of what we're doing with the Open uh, Education Research University project. And uh, the OER Foundation is a nonprofit foundation which is leading this initiative. Um, uh, the OER Foundation uh, founded Wiki Educator. And you want to look at, uh, there's quite a few participants in it, and I won't go into the details of the roles of the different people who have been in there, but one interesting thing is that there's more older people than younger people, which was a surprise to them. Um, uh, we do workshops right around the world. Uh, we've trained about uh, uh, 4,000 people in developing countries on how to use wikis for learning. Uh, um, we're promoting uh, uh, digital uh, literacy, and uh, most of the people who we train have never even seen a wiki or used one before. So, so we've been doing a lot with that. And uh, uh, with the logic model, um, we're talking about, uh, um, we started off with a meeting with 200 participants from 46 countries around the world. So um, there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, we're trying to strike a balance between open education and so it's sustainable, to make it a sustainable proposition, and using open education resources, open educational uh, practices, we want to break the iron triangle that they say, oh, when you increase quality, uh, you have to increase costs. If you lower quality, you can increase costs. And, uh, we say that we can break that triangle now. It's possible in the digital world to do that. And uh, really we're talking about a return to tradition um, where uh, um, the uh, uh, University of London in 1860 started. Um, they had this whole system is um, you learn any way you want, you take their exams and uh, you get credit from the University of London. It's been going since 1860. 
five Nobel Prize winners have graduated from uh, the University of London. Um, we talk about the tragedy of the commons. How many are familiar with the sort of a seminal paper about the tragedy of the commons? And of course the argument is uh, the commons is a limited space and the internet is so unlimited um, that the tragedy of the commons doesn't occur. Um, but in fact, the whole paper is false. It's mistaken. Um, the commons still exist in England. There has been no tragedy of the commons. They still have commons. In the United States and Canada, we still have the open range. It exists. So there was no tragedy. Um, it was a, a theoretical speculation. And uh, um, there's an old uh, poem about it when they started to take away the, uh, the commons. They didn't, they didn't take away the commons from people uh, because it was uh, uh, being misused. They took it away because uh, private property interests wanted to do it. The same way as they're putting in closed gardens on the internet, trying to uh, uh, keep it to themselves and to take, take out any uh, free content. But uh, uh, I think that this poem is quite uh, interesting from 1760s. Uh, they hang the man and flog the woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leave the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, in those days, they didn't have uh, gender equality, so um, the hanging and flogging was different. So I'm sure we do it different today. Uh, but that's what's happening: is people are taking this commons away and making it private and proprietary. And uh, this is the the common knowledge of mankind is on the internet, and uh, we need to protect that. And uh, we're doing it, and we're saying that there's disruptive innovations. If you remember Kodak, the leading camera company, and uh, they discontinued Kodachrome, the best-selling uh, uh, film in the world at the time, and uh, a few years ago, and now it's over, and it happened very quickly. And so thing, changes can happen very quickly. Um, ice harvesting used to be one of the biggest industries in the United States, and uh, well, when they brought in artificial ice, they actually had people arguing that, uh, oh, artificial ice, it's not as good as natural ice. <laughs> you know, it's like you hear people saying, oh, digital sound is not as, it's not as crisp as uh, the old, uh, 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 what, records, God, I mean, <laughs> so long ago, right? The old records. Uh, the same thing, yeah. Um, so. Uh, you get these types of criticisms, and we're prepared uh, uh, for these criticisms, and uh, we want to make sure we're on firm ground. And there's a number of open education red herrings. The, one, the first one is the sky is falling, or they're poor quality. And we want to really address those right up and say, no, um, the sky isn't falling. You can still make it, uh, 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 you can still function in a sustainable system. Uh, so it's going to be a transformation. I better rush through because uh, uh, they're all there. But uh, uh, there are now ten. There are now ten universities on on five continents that are participating in this. Three of them are from the United States, two from Canada, one from Australia, three community colleges from New Zealand, uh, the the University of South Africa, and. <coughs> Um, uh, and uh, a university in India, which I can't pronounce the name, so I won't even try it. Uh, there they are, and there's the name, the Baba Sahib Amdekar, so you know why I was stupid enough to try to pronounce it. There you go. So, uh, um, that is the view, and uh, um, I'll just open it up. As a, we only have a few minutes. I'm going to open it up for questions and discussion now. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you for that. That was a great overview. Um, I have two related questions. One, will a student take one examination for a particular course that will apply for credit at all ten institutions, or are there individualized examinations for each of these institutions and then 
what are the projected costs associated with these expenditures? Um, good questions. Uh, the first one is we expect that most students will do it in their national area. So uh, American students would go to one of the participating American partners, Canadians, and go there. Uh, but internationally, it depends on each institution what they want to recognize. I do know that our institution will recognize any courses um, from all of those institutions. Um, uh, with the proviso, we would have a closer look at the Indian one. But the others, we wouldn't even look. We would just give a straight blank of transfer. Um, the, other, the other institutions uh, will probably do the same, but it's not guaranteed. We want the institutions are going to be independent. They can do what they want with it. We're not, it's a confederation, not a federation. So it's up to them. Uh, now the price, we're looking at a price point of less than one quarter the price of a course for the exam. So um, we're looking at our average courses are $650 and we're looking to get it below $200. We now charge $350 for challenge exams. We think it's too much, but we're going to automate them. We're going to have exams, computerized automated exam systems. And uh, as I said, we're looking at how we can reduce our PLR uh, costs to be able to do that. Over here. Yeah, um, two just same questions in one, not hopefully many questions. Um, one is that um, so when you give uh, tests, um, you know, there's this uh, pos potential for kind of forum shopping. Um, students might take this course from this university, that course from that university, because they know, they figured out somehow, those professors are easier than others. Um, and get good, good grade very quickly and graduate and get a degree, right? Um, so how do you prevent that? And also, um, if that, so much of that happens online, um, do you have a potentially a, a risk of students not taking the exam but get someone else to answer the questions or do whatever the assignments are? Yeah. That, those are two questions. Yeah. And then the other thing, I'm sorry, is that um, so um, everything will be uh, open uh, educational resources, but will there be a lot of uh, um, reuse of those materials that you expect either between the institutions involved or if even from other institutions? That's another question. Well, on, on the reuse question, yes, uh, we're going to reuse and each institution has to put, put out uh, two courses that they'll give a credit to. And, uh, um, but they don't have to create the courses. They could take, we could take two courses from Carnegie Mellon and say, we'll give credit for those courses. So, and we want that. We want people, forget about creating courses, let's start assembling courses. Mm -hmm. Let's start using what's out there. This is one of the biggest problems with OER is people aren't using it. <coughs> now, for students cheating, uh, that's the same problem in traditional universities. So, we have the same problem. We have to address that. And uh, we're looking now at automated systems and we're experimenting with them where uh, they can tell by how you use the keyboard, whether it's you or not. And we have a camera, a special secure camera, that we ship to the student so as we can see them and we know who they are. So there are some ways we can do it. I mean, right now what we do is we send students to the, if they're in a small town somewhere, to the local RCMP station and then the sergeant. Uh, <laughs> the so there's ways of doing it, but we want to get it more automated so as it's a cheaper process. Yes, any other? Um, yes. Um, um, when you have uh, collected enough uh, of those uh, uh, credits and, and you want to get a degree, um, there, is a, there is a problem that, uh, for instance, when you want to get a degree in uh, informatics, that you, for instance, have all kinds of courses on database, but nothing on and compiles to, to make the next subject. So there is a disparate balance in the total number of uh, credits you have. In which way are students supported in get, get the right balance to the in, in, our institutions uh, taking uh, account of this? Well, uh, that's what we're going to be doing is we're going to be developing pathways. And we're not going to develop the courses, but we're going to say, you know, these are the OERs out there. You do this, you do that. This will give you um, uh, uh, the material you need to pass an exam in computer science. And for computer science, you need to pass exams in this, 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 and this. 
So um, that's the way now. We're starting off uh, in a very general way. We're looking at a first year certificate, um, associate degree, a general, and a general Bachelor of Arts. We have a general Bachelor of Arts, three year Bachelor of Arts, and uh, we'll take any kind of credits. It's a general one, it's not specific. Uh, but we have to be careful of that. So if they want to have a business, Bachelor of Business, they have to go through the business school and take business courses. But we, we need to provide the pathways for people to do that. Yes? Um, within the open aspect, are you going to be publishing like, the financials of this? Like how much money went into it, how much money you're making, so if this does, is it actually sustainable or not? Or is that going to be all, all ten partners have agreed that this is going to be totally transparent. It will all be published on the internet, the finances, everything. And even the first, the meeting we're having, November the 8th and uh, 9th, 9th and 10th? 9th and, November 9th and 10th in New Zealand, it's open online and anyone can participate. Cool. Anyone, anyone can. Everything will be totally transparent. You know, so WikiLeaks won't be able to find anything. <laughs> <laughs> or if, the, if he does, we'll, we'll uh, thank him for it. Okay, thank you very much.